everyone. It certainly is exciting to be here tonight and to share with you the subject of Russia and its march on the Middle East that has been prophesied in, uh, in the Bible. The events going on in the world around us are certainly causing a lot of alarm all over the place. And uh, among Bible students, though, they are a cause of great excitement because they announce to us the return of the Lord Jesus Christ to the earth. We read in the book of Revelation in chapter 16 in the 15th verse, Behold, I come as a thief. Blessed is he that watcheth and keepeth his garments, lest he walk naked and they see his shame. And then he goes on to say he gathered them together to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So what excites us about what we're seeing going on in the Middle East is that we know that before Armageddon takes place, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the earth. That's the sequence of events that are given to us in Revelation chapter 16 and verses 15 and 16. The book of Revelation is called the Apocalypse. That's the original use of the word. It means to reveal or to show forward something. And at the beginning of the book in chapter 1, in verse 1, we read that it's the revelation or the apocalypse of Jesus Christ which God gave to him to show to his servants things which must shortly come to pass. And he tells us that the time is at hand. So it encourages us to pay attention because in no age that anybody has really lived is this expression being more relevant than today. We live on the very eve of the momentous events that are going to change the world forever. And we intend to spend the next hour or so looking at some of those prophecies that are given to us in the Bible. The Bible contains a lot of information about the future. And it's very helpful to us to, to be able to see this and to recognize that God tells us the events from the past. And in Daniel chapter 2, when Daniel meets the king Nebuchadnezzar, he tells the king that there's a God in heaven, verse 28, that reveals secrets and makes known to the king Nebuchadnezzar what shall be in the latter days. So that's the subject of much of Bible prophecy, what's going to take place in the latter days. And in fact, the prophet Amos tells us that surely the Lord God will do nothing, but he reveals his secrets to his servants, the prophets, in Amos chapter 3 and at verse 6. And so that's what he does. He tells us ahead of time what he's going to do, and he does it for a good reason. It's Isaiah 46 and verse 9. He says, I am God, there is none else. There is none like me. Why? Well, because he says, I declare the end from the beginning and from ancient times the things that are not yet done. So that's what our God does. He tells us what's happened way in the past, uh, or what's going to happen in the future, way, into, uh, way in the past. So his counsel, he says, is going to stand, and he's going to do all of his pleasure. So those are just a couple of passages for us to think about when we're looking at our subject tonight, is that God has told the end from the beginning, and that's the purpose of Bible prophecy, to keep us excited about what's going on and to recognize the time in, in which we live. Well, we'd like to focus our, our session tonight on looking at the Middle East and the events that are going on there and what is going to lead up to the Battle of Armageddon that is described for us in the Bible. So it's really this invasion that's given to us in Ezekiel chapter 38. So Revelation chapter 16, the passage we looked at, verse 16, is that Battle of Armageddon. The detail of it is given in the 38th chapter of Ezekiel. So if you've got a Bible open, turn to Ezekiel chapter 38, and you might want to just keep this open in front of you because this is where we're going to spend some of our time looking at who this, this great host is that's going to be involved in this conflagration. Now the interesting thing is Ezekiel chapter 38 has parallels. There's parallels in Joel, Zechariah, Daniel, all these different prophecies talk about an invasion in the time of the end. Well chapter 38 tells us of the, the hostile nations. We read in verse 2, Son of man, set thy face against Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, as the RSV and ESV puts it, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. And he goes on to talk about in verse 5, nations of Persia, Ethiopia, Libya with them, all of them with shield and helmer, helmet, Gomer and all his bands, the house of Tagarmer, the north quarters, and all his bands, and many people with thee. Now it's really an entirely different subject to go through and identify who all these nations are. I'm just going to sort of explain them to you. Um, there's many historians that give us information on this, but Gog is the leader of confederacy, 
of which he says comes from the land of Magog. Now those of us who are a little bit older remember what was called the Cold War, and Eastern Europe, or the Warsaw Pact, which is between the River Don and the River Danube, is that area of Scythia, or Magog. Rosh corresponds with Russia in the north, Meshach to the area around Moscow, or the Muscovites, Tobolsk is Tubal, Persia, we knew it as Persia just a few years back, there was the Shah of Persia, or the Shah of Iran, as it is called today. Uh, Ethiopia and Libya have maintained their names, although they were a bigger geographical area. Gomer would correspond to the area of Turkey, originally Galatia, but then we have the Gomeric tribes, which migrated across, across Europe and ended up settling in Gaul, which of course, Galatia, Gaulatia, that's the same sort of idea. So you have the Gauls, who would be from the area of Gomer, so it's Western Europe, including much of uh, Germany as well, and Tagarma, which is the area up to the north of Turkey, um, Azerbaijan, Georgia, the uh, Caucasus areas. So those are the, the nations, and again, like I say, it would be a whole other class if we were to go through them. But in general terms, if you look at Ezekiel chapter 38 and verse 15, he says that this host is going to come out of the north parts. And he's going to come with a great military host, riding horses, a great company, and a mighty army. And that north parts is rendered in the RSV, the Revised Standard Version, and in the Hebrew, as the uttermost parts of the north. And when we, we take all that information and we put it on a map, it might be a little hard to read from where you are, but those, there's the Mediterranean Sea and the, the current nations. But if we were to superimpose over that, the nations talked about in Ezekiel chapter 38, there is the geographical regions that we have with their ancient names. Russia in the north with Moscow above it, the uh, land of Magog, Gomer, Javan comes up elsewhere, which is Greece. Um, and then you have Assyria, Media, Persia, Babylon, which would be Iraq, uh, Libya, or Foot, as it's sometimes called in the, in, the, in the Old Testament, and Cush, or Ethiopia. So that kind of gives you the idea. So those are the nations that are involved as the aggressors in Ezekiel chapter 38, who make up part of the situation that we read about, part of Daniel as well, Daniel chapter 11. But we're also given the timing for when this is going to take place. And we say, okay, well, what exactly is that timing and Ezekiel 38, if you've got it open in front of you, come over to verse 8, because we read there, it's after many days you're going to be visited. In the latter years, well, you shall come into the land that's brought back from the sword and is gathered out of many people and against the mountains of Israel, which have always been waste, but they're brought forward of the nations and they're going to dwell safely, all of them. So that kind of gives you the time frame. It's when the Jews are back in the land, in the latter years, when the people who were once scattered are now gathered together and they're living in that land. Well, that took place over the period of the 19, or 18, late 1800s through the 1940s when there was a, a great returning of the Jews from the land in great numbers um, back into the land of Palestine, as it was called at the time. This is the Haganah ship Exodus, 1942. And they would congregate there over a period of time until eventually, on May the 14th, 1948, the state of Israel would be proclaimed by David Ben-Gurion in Tel Aviv. So that's the Jews back in the land. So we know that we're living in the latter days because Ezekiel says that the latter days equate with the time when the land is gathered out of many people and they're going to dwell again. But he also says, on the mountains of Israel. And the prophet Joel, in chapter 3, kind of flushes out what that means to us. Joel chapter 3, verse 1. Behold in those days, and in that time, what time? When I bring again the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. That's the time, he says, I'm going to gather all the nations. Remember Revelation 16? He gathered them to a place called in the Hebrew tongue Armageddon. So the gathering of nations takes place in the context of the captivity of Judah and Jerusalem. We say to yourself, what was Judah and Jerusalem? Well, the ancient city of Judah, or uh, uh, area of Judah, is what we call today, uh, or Judea as it was, was be the West Bank, um, as it's called in the, in the media. And Samaria to the north, right? So Jude, Judea and Samaria is what we call West Bank, and of course the city of Jerusalem itself is right on the, the edge of that area. Well, it wasn't until 1967 when the captivity of Jerusalem was brought back because the Six Days War took place almost 50 years ago. They fought for six days, 
And on the seventh day, they rested. And they had brought back again uh, Jerusalem from the hands of the Gentiles, finishing what the Lord Jesus Christ refers to as the times of the Gentiles. That's referred to from Daniel chapter 8 and uh, picked up in the Olivet Prophecies. So that's the time period. And we could talk a lot more on that, but it kind of gives you the basic idea that we're in that time period. 1967 would have been the captivity of Jerusalem restored. The people are back in the land. So this equates with us the latter days. And it's at some time in those latter days that God is going to bring all these nations down into Jerusalem uh, and into Israel to battle. Well, what about the main nation that is involved in this group? And that is the nation of Russia. It's the Rosh of uh, Ezekiel chapter 38 and the king of the north that is described to us in Daniel chapter 11. So what about Russia? Because when you look at Russia's sort of resume over the last little while, it's not exactly the most stellar that you would think of somebody that could sort of, you know, pull something like this off. In fact, if you go back in the time uh, in history to the time of the Tsars, the last of the Tsars is Nicholas II here. And Russia was ruled by Tsars for about a period of 600 years since Ivan IV, who was the first Tsar, right the way through to this, this guy here. And um, it was an empire. He was an autocrat. He was the supreme ruler. But that empire would come crumbling down in and around the year 1917, when these two Charlies showed up and overthrew the whole thing with some other friends that helped them out. Uh, Lenin, of course, and Stalin. Vladimir Lenin, the leader of the uprising, the popular uprising, uh, the communists, and Joseph Stalin, who would succeed him, the brutal dictator who ruled Russia for 30 years, right the way through the period of the, the uh, Second World War, these were the two leaders that would become the first leaders of the USSR. And for many years, the Western world lived under fear of this whole group of people and their cronies. And uh, the ones that, like Khrushchev, he was the one who, during the Cold War, the nuclear missile program, um, the Cuban Missile Crisis, if you were around then with Kennedy, you'll remember that, Brezhnev, the best set of eyebrows I've ever seen in my life, right? And here's the guy that would be the one who would send troops into Czechoslovakia and begin the invasion of Afghanistan. Andropov would follow him. He only lasted for about 15 months, um, but he was head of the KGB formerly and was again involved in this occupation of Afghanistan. Chemenko, only about 13 months as well. He didn't last very long either. And then, of course, Secretary Chairman Gorbachev, and under him, everything changed. And in fact, giving talks on Bible prophecy back in this point in time, some people would say, well, should we talk about Russia anymore? I mean, like, it's kind of like, you know, there's not a whole lot there that you really want to... And I'd say, listen, the Bible says it's going to be Russia that's going to do this. But notice what it also says. There's this little phrase that shows up in Ezekiel chapter 38, and it's at verse 4. And that tells you that although Russia is going to come forth, before that, there's going to be a temporary arrest of their progress. Ezekiel 38 verse 4 says, I will turn thee back and put hooks in thy jaws. And then he's going to bring him forth with all his army and horses and horsemen, uh, all of them clothed all sorts of armor and so on and so forth. So for the years leading up to um, the fall of the Soviet Union, what we saw was a collapse under uh, Mikhail Gorbachev. In 1986, we had Gorbachev meeting with President Reagan and the nuclear arms treaty that was signed. In 1987 and 1988, he met with uh, the, pre the British Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. And in 1988, they withdrew from Afghanistan after these meetings. Uh, in 1989, they met with the Pope. And during this period of time, of course, there was great turmoil in Europe, beginning really around 1981, but really culminating in 1989, because you had that great solidarity movement, La Cloenza, and um, the whole sort of freedom that was wanted in Europe, that of course would come in 1989, when you would see the, uh, the Berlin Wall come crashing down, and followed up in 1991, where the USSR would pass into history after Gorbachev would resign. So that's kind of like, you know, what happened to this, this whole empire was it just seemed to become nothing. 
And in fact, as Gorbachev sort of passed off the scene, once he was gone, then you would have along coming um, Yeltsin, Boris Yeltsin, 1991 through 1999, so the dark years of the Russian uh, Federation as it was, very turbulent years, years of economic collapse. Russia was written off by most people as irrelevant, a thing of the past, and uh, you know, all kinds of problems. But of course, Yeltsin, he had his decade, so to speak, and by the end of it, 1999, he was replaced by an unknown guy, somebody who just came out of the blue, former KGB uh, FSB agent and chief, Vladimir Putin. And um, he just sort of appeared on the scene, and people were like, well, who is this guy? He doesn't even belong to a party. So they made a party up, and he joined it, and ran for president, and somehow miraculously made it in. And so... Um, under him, we heard about things like, you know, and people would say, well, Russia's still, you know, done, because there was that whole Baltic Sea issue, the Bering Sea, I think it was, where they had the Kursk, the, uh, the nuclear sub that, you know, burst into flames, and, and uh, everybody said, well, see, that's an, ex an example of Russia. I said, well, wait a minute. What it's an example of is they're bringing the subs out again. Like they've been sitting, rotting for a decade, but all of a sudden we got subs running around in the ocean again. What are they doing? And it was under Putin that they began to restore the, the Navy. And so his first step was really to restore the economy. So there was lots of military or economic reforms, and the oil and the gas began to really, really flow, and they started making a lot of money on it. And he turned Russia into an economic superpower. And he used the money from that to fund the military. And it was during his first go-around that Putin basically uh, brought about the Chechen War. He ran for two terms as president, and, and of course, both of those were quite successful. But by 2008, legally, he couldn't run anymore because they had that rule that like America has as well. You can run two uh, terms as president, and after that, you have to step down. Not like Canada where you have the same guy over and over again, you know. But so, so he figured, well, you know, what are we going to do here? So he got his crony, uh, Medvedev who came along in 2008, he became prime minister or uh, president and Russia, uh, Russia's Putin swapped jobs with him and he became prime minister and just kind of like moved back while Medvedev turned around and changed the constitution and said that he could run again and um, that's exactly what he did. So he returned to power in 2011 but during the time of Medvedev's rule the uh, Ossetia war went on in Georgia, a big fight over oil and gas lines going through that area and um, Putin comes back in 2011, and of course the military buildup has continued. And one of the big things that we saw under his last or his last reign really has been the uh, the Ukrainian war and the annexing of the Crimea. What's interesting though is that yes, there would be a temporary reversal of power, but then God says, "I will bring thee forth," and the scriptures tell us where Russia is going to go next. It tells us what it's going to set its sights on. So come back to Ezekiel chapter 38, looking at verse 4, he says, I will turn thee back. So we've looked, looked at that, how there was a temporary arrest of their progress. And then he says, I'm going to put hooks in your jaws and I'm going to bring you forth. And he says, it's all thine army, horses, horsemen, clothed with all sorts of armor, great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. And they're going to come down into the Middle East. But notice that they are a heavily militarized group. So they don't just come back from obscurity as an economic superpower. They come back as a very militarized power and an aggressor that's going to be back on the scene. Well, in watching the news of the last little while, and you, know, you, you look stuff up and you read it and look at it on the internet or whatever you do, get your newspaper. Some people still buy newspapers. It's a good thing because I work for a company that prints them, but it's getting less and less. Um, but when you, when you look at the news and um, you see what's going on, what you're realizing is that that whole jaunt into the Crimea, you listen to what world leaders have to say. Now, this guy doesn't look very old, and he probably isn't, um, but he's the Estonian Prime Minister who on February 13th of this year said, Russia's aggression in Ukraine has fundamentally changed the situation, the security situation, in the whole of Europe. And NATO has responded with a higher readiness. So this is a Prime Minister saying that the game has changed. 
It's changed a lot. In fact, another guy, a guy named Anders um, Ramusen, he is the former Secretary General of NATO, on February the 5th, turned around and says, look, this whole thing in Ukraine, it's not about Ukraine. Putin wants to restore Russia to its former position as a great power. There is a high probability that he will intervene in the Baltics to test NATO's Article 5. Right? So this has been going on in Ukraine, and these are not like nobody sort of Bible prophecy freak nuts, you know, that are saying, look what's going on. This is like world leaders saying, look what's going on. And so the head of NATO is sounding the alarm. But the scripture is very clear. This is a militarized host. A resurgent Russia is going to be militarized, and it's going to militarize its partners. Take a look at Ezekiel chapter 38. Pick up the language again, verse 4. Army, horses, horsemen, armor, a great company with bucklers and shields, all of them handling swords. The cross-reference, if you care to look at it, is Daniel chapter 11 and verse 40. Here he talks in terms of two great hosts, a king of the north and a king of the south. And in Daniel chapter 11, verse 40, he talks about a time of the end when the king of the south is going to push at him, which is actually Turkey, and then the king of the north is going to come against the same him, which is Turkey, like a whirlwind. And we'll look at that in just a moment, with chariots and horses, a horseman with many ships. And he's going to enter into the countries and pass over, and overflow and pass over. So you have chariots, which today we would call tanks, with the horsemen, and many ships. Well, today we have both ships of the sea and we also have airships in today's world. So, if that's what we read about is in the Bible, what does the news tell us about the resurgent Russia? Is it an, is it a, is it an economic power only, or what is taking place? Well, this is March the 11th, 2014. The Russian Navy is to receive 24 subs, 54 warships by 2020. So this is the head of the, the Russian military, Defense Minister Shogu. He says, as a result of the implementation of state rearmament program to 220, the Navy should receive eight nuclear-powered strategic submarines, uh, 16 multi-role submarines, and 54 warships of various classes. So if we think Russia is rotting away and finished, think again. This is what they're doing with their military. And that is from the Russian news out of Moscow. Well, Newsweek on March the 30th, 2015, tells us that they're not keeping those arms in Russia either. These are being moved, or some of them, into European arms depots. We read Vladimir Putin quietly has been arming another area inside Europe's borders. Kaliningrad, the Russian seaport city in the region sandwiched between Poland and Lithuania, a little piece of the empire they held on to, with convenient access to the Baltic Sea. Vessels from Russia's Baltic fleet have delivered fighter jets, missile launchers to the former German city, from where missiles could not just reach uh, Warsaw, um, but they could basically reach um, all kinds of other places, Germany as well. So they've been spending much time in preparing all of this. Now, this is a headline now from just last week. This is last Tuesday, September the 29th. The UK Express says the UK must prepare for war with Russia. The army calls for a fleet of battle tanks to take on Putin. And so that's the headline. Britain must invest in a fleet of main battle, or battle tanks to meet the increasing uh, threat of a ground war with Russia. What is this all about? Well, the prospect of a conventional ground war in Eastern Europe, he says, can no longer be ignored. So a ground war in Eastern Europe is the prospect that this leading commander is concerned about. And probably for good reason. Because when you look at what's been going on, this is March 27th of this year, the Russian Air Force and Navy are to receive 200 aircraft in 2015. That's more than most world air forces even have. So what they're getting in addition to what they've already got is what more than most air forces actually possess altogether. And so what are they doing with these planes? Well, the Russian heavy bombers flew more out-of-area patrols in 2014 than in any other year since the Cold War. 
This is just some nobody. Actually, it is somebody. It's Admiral William Gortney, the commander of the U.S. Northern Command. He's telling us that Russia has done more since 2014 than it did in any year since the Cold War began. So that whole area of, of events is basically picking up. What's also interesting is Ukraine. What was such the big deal about the Ukraine? Well, if you go back, and this has been proven in the news in the last little bit, but go back to March the 30th of this year, Russia says its Crimean military buildup has been completed. Uh, it intends to use its presence there to spearhead Russian interests in the Mediterranean Sea, extending Russia's presence in long-range sea zones. That's what Sevastopol was all about. So when they annexed the Crimea, it wasn't about the Crimea. Just like the one prime minister said, it's got nothing to do with Ukraine. What they're looking for is to restore themselves to power. And to do that, they need a jump-off spot. So the Crimea and Sevastopol is the jump-off spot. And they're going to use it to extend into the area of the Mediterranean Sea. Well, funny that, because that's exactly what they've been doing. But how concerned should we be? You know, is this just sort of Bible prophecy, you know, zealots getting a little excited about what's going on in the world? Well, let's listen to what the head U.S. military brass have to say about this. The outgoing U.S. Army Chief of Staff calling Russia the most dangerous threat to the United States today. More than ISIS, more than China. I'm concerned. They have shown uh, some significant capability in Ukraine to do operations that are fairly sophisticated. And so for me, I think we should pay a lot of uh, attention because a true deterrent is one where people are worried that if they do conduct operations, there will be some level of response. And I think we have to continue to improve what that level of response might look at so we can deter. Vladimir Putin's Russia behaves in many respects as in, in some respects, and in very important respects, as an antagonist. That is new. That is something, therefore, that we need to adjust to and counter. Russia poses uh, existential threat to the United States by virtue simply of the size of the nuclear arsenal that it's had. If you want to talk about a nation that, that could pose an existential threat to the United States, I'd have to point to Russia. And if you look at their behavior, it's nothing short of alarming. I would put Russia right now from a military perspective as the number one threat. The United States is concerned by reports uh, that Russia may have deployed uh, additional military personnel and aircraft uh, to Syria, uh, precisely because it's difficult to decipher uh, their intentions. These steps could lead to greater loss of life, they could increase refugee flows and risk confrontation uh, with the counter-ISIL coalition that's operating uh, inside of Syria. Well, what about what the Bible has to say about the other players? We have Babylon, we've got Syria and Iraq, we have Persia, who we know better as Iran. What about these nations, uh, what the prophets tell us, who are going to make up some of the participants in this attack force that's going to come. Well, all those nations together, out of them, a couple we just want to zone in on is Persia, or Iran, um, who is with them, along with Ethiopia and Libya. Well, a growing alliance, as you may have noticed in the news, has been going on between Russia and Persia. In fact, the whole Middle Eastern Nuclear Arms Treaty that's just been signed, uh, not by Israel, incidentally, but amongst other nations, um, had Russia's full support and, in fact, was quarterbacked by Russia. The U.S. watching carefully. A very friendly handshake between Russian President Vladimir Putin and Iranian President Hassan Rouhani. Just one symbol of what the U.S. increasingly sees as a dangerous alliance. Listen to Vladimir Putin press for Iran's desire to have an arms embargo lifted. We think Iran should have sanctions removed, the question being in what period of time and how quickly. Russia has already lifted a ban on the sale of a sophisticated air defense system to Iran, a Russian weapon that could shield Iran's nuclear facilities from future airstrikes. There's also jet aircraft, 
armored tanks, armored personnel carriers, artilleries, trucks. These are the kind of conventional weapons that could fuel a Middle East arms race. And Iran may soon have a lot more money in its pockets. There's no question that if you lift these embargoes now and at the same time are giving Iran access to some of its frozen billions of dollars, Iran will be able to accelerate its missile program, which threatens Israel and the rest of the Middle East. The current Joint Chiefs Chairman leaving no question where he stands. Under no circumstances should we relieve pressure on Iran relative to ballistic missile uh, capabilities and arms trafficking. So that gives you an idea of the concern the world has in the arming of Iran and the alliance that's formed between Iran and Russia. But as you mentioned in Daniel chapter 2, when this great image is finally destroyed, it says that, you know, it's iron, Rome, uh, the clay, which would be the European element, the brass, uh, Greece, Medo-Persia, uh, which is the silver, the gold, Assyria, and Babylon. They're broken in pieces together like the chaff of the summer threshing floor. So they have to be together. And it's interesting that during the first Gulf War, Iraq was really separated away from any Russian influence. And for a while there, it was under American hegemony. It was basically run by America. Lots of Americans gave their lives for Iraq. But that has all been changing. The Bible says that at the time of the end, these elements of this image are going to be together. Well, that's exactly what has been taking place. But at the end of the day, uh, what the Americans now are most worried about is that the Iraqis, uh, you know, having been a long-term ally for the United States, the Iraqi army has been trained by the U.S. and equipped by the U.S., is now directly uh, fed up, uh, sorry, fed up with the Americans and now directly coordinating with the Russians. So there we have it, that the, the Iraqis are concerned that the Americans are going to be um, no longer in charge of what's going on in Russia. So turn in your Bibles, if you've got them open, back to Ezekiel chapter 38, because we're going to look at the fourth verse. Ezekiel chapter 38, and we're looking at verse 4, where we read, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. Because in this part of the verse, not only are they going to prepare, but they are also going to be a guard to the nations that are going to be assembled with them. So that's the passage of Scripture. Russia has to not only prepare itself that we've been looking at, but it also has to prepare and to arm some of the other nations. Nations that are going to be with it, such as Syria and Iraq and the other ones that form this confederacy. So it was interesting, just a little while ago, uh, March 27th, when this whole Syria issue was starting to boil up, that President Bashar al-Assad had the following to say. And the title in Yahoo News was, Russia, Iran, Syria share the same vision, right? So here's what he says. It's not only about Syria, what's going on over in the Middle East. It's about the future of the world. They, that is the Russians, want to be a great power that has their own say in the future of this world. They want stability and a, and a political solution. Syria and Iran and Russia see eye to eye regarding this conflict. So the very alliance that we read about in the, in the Bible, Daniel 11, Ezekiel 38, and so on and so forth, what we find is that this is what we're seeing develop in the Middle East. And of course, the whole problem in Syria has now drawn Russia into that area once again. A Russian-made armored vehicle spotted on the move inside Syria, painted in Russian army camouflage. Just the latest indication of what the U.S. fears is an imminent Russian military buildup to prop up Syrian President Bashar al-Assad. U.S. satellites have observed at least three massive Russian Antonov aircraft offloading building supplies and air traffic control equipment, and another Russian aircraft bringing in personnel, all in recent days. U.S. defense officials say 
they expect eventually to see more than 1,000 Russian troops running the airbase and possibly launching airstrikes against moderate rebels Assad is fighting. So I'm sure many of us saw the pictures that were on the news of the Russians with their planes, tanks, and helicopters. Uh, satellite images, this one from uh, the 20th of September, telling us that Russia was coming in with 1,000 to 1,500 to 2,500 troops. And of course, Russia is not denying this. In fact, um, what we read of in the newspapers, this was on the 26th of September, it tells us that this war is not just going on between a ruthless dictator and his opponents, it's a complex geopolitical confrontation in which several countries are involved directly or through proxies. The question is whether the two powerful groups, the West and its Gulf allies, and the Russia-Iran-Syria trio can find common ground. Interesting that he breaks them down into the Gulf and the Western nations, and Russia, Iran, and Syria, one which is identified in the scriptures as the king of the north, the other as the king of the south. Well, of course, Bashar al-Assad has been struggling to hold on to what's left of his Syria. And you see here basically the area that's left to him. It's not a whole lot. It's uh, in light pink there on the screen. And the Russians have been moving into Latakia, uh, where they have an air base there that we were just seeing about. And, of course, there's another one uh, just below that. Uh, Tardus, the naval base, the, where they are bringing in their, their troops. The interesting thing is how Russia got its forces here was through the Crimea, the Sebastopol seaport, going right the way through, traveling through the Mediterranean into Latakia, and to, or to uh, Tardus, the, the port, but also flying with permission through Iran and Iraq and through into Syria, breaking nobody's airspace and coming in purely uh, on their own volition, um, in a completely interesting and actually legal way. It's interesting that Putin, when he stood up to address the United Nations, and we didn't put his up there because it was in, uh, in uh, Russian, um, but he says, we hope that the international community will be able to develop a comprehensive strategy of political stabilization as well as social and economic recovery in the Middle East. So he says, like, we want a, an international coalition to solve the problem in the Middle East. I believe it's of utmost importance to help restore government's institutions in Libya, support the new government in Iraq, provide comprehensive assistance to the legitimate government of Syria. So those are three of the nations that are all to do with uh, the nations that are talked about in Ezekiel chapter 38. Well, let's have a listen to what um, the uh, head of NATO has to say. NATO is ready to defend and protect uh, all allies against uh, any threat. And that, of course, uh, also uh, goes for or is valid for Turkey. And uh, uh, we have seen increased turmoil, increased uh, uncertainty, uh, violence. Uh, to the south of the NATO borders in Turkey, in, 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 in Syria and Iraq, bordering Turkey. And uh, this is uh, one of the reasons why we have increased the readiness and the preparedness of our forces, so we, shall, so, so we can be able to deploy forces uh, if uh, needed. But NATO has to respond when we see a more assertive Russia uh, behaving the way it has behaved over the last uh, uh, period. We've seen increasingly unprofessional behavior from Russian forces. They violated Turkish airspace, which, ought, which, as all of us here made clear earlier this week and strongly affirmed today here in Brussels, is NATO airspace. They've shot cruise missiles from a ship in the Caspian Sea without warning. They've come within just a few miles of one of our unmanned aerial vehicles. They have initiated a joint ground offensive with the Syrian regime shattering the facade that they're there to fight ISIL. This will have consequences for Russia itself, which is right rightfully fearful of attack upon Russia. And I also expect that in coming days, the Russians will begin to suffer casualties in Syria. Now, it's interesting that Israel as well has expressed some concern. This is last week as well. 
um, last Tuesday, September 29th. Nobody wants to see Russian forces in the area of the Golan Heights, but we definitely don't want to see the Iranian forces near Israel. So that's his comment. And we've been to Israel. We were there just uh, this last June. And when you stand in Tel Dan, in the ancient city of Laish, in the north of Israel, and you look out, you can see Lebanon, and you can see the mountains of Syria. You are 40 kilometers, divided by 1.6 for miles, away from the, uh, the city Damascus. Now that's just like the next town up the road. Just a small ways away is from Israel's northern border to the city of Damascus, right? And so obviously Israel doesn't want to see Iranian troops anywhere near that border or Russians. The other thing they don't like is what's going on with Hezbollah. You see, the Russians have given the Syrians all kinds of equipment and tanks, so the Syrians have said, hey, Hezbollah, why don't we give you our used stuff? So 75 Russian-made tanks have gone to the Lebanese terror group Hezbollah, intended to help Hezbollah create an armored division, one of Israel's sworn enemies and the ones who were firing rockets into Israel just a few years ago. That's what's going on in the land. Now, last week, it was all like, you know, like satellite photos and all this kind of stuff. Well, it's a lot more than that this week. This is the air base in Latakia from which Russian jets are launching their sorties against Islamic State targets uh, here in Syria. But security here, I've got to tell you, uh, is heavy. As for what's been happening here on this airfield, well, it's been busy. During our stay at the airfield, we've been uh, able to squeeze a few uh, details out of them. For example, when aircraft come in to land, they always come in maneuvering, landing at different angles, so as to uh, make the job of any uh, spotter around here more difficult. So it's no longer satellite photos. They have embedded reporters right there watching these planes taking off and coming back in. This is a very, very real situation that's going on in the Middle East. What's really interesting, though, is the spin that Russia's put on it. Because their actions are 100% legal according to international law, whereas the actions of America and its allies are actually not. Breaking news of the sour, the Russian Defense Ministry has confirmed that Russian fighter planes have conducted their first airstrikes against ISIL positions in Syria. And it's after the Russian president was given the go-ahead by Russian lawmakers. The only way to combat terrorism in Syria and in neighboring countries is to act preventatively, to destroy the terrorists on the territories that they've already captured. Russia has always supported and still supports the fight against terrorism. But we are sure that this fight should be conducted according to international law. You cannot avoid the impression that the uh, legal basis of the coalition activities in Syria is really flawed. You cannot operate without Security Council mandate. You cannot operate without the consent of the country in question. And uh, we said from the very beginning when the coalition was announced that it was a mistake not to go to the Security Council. It was a mistake. Uh, it was a, another mistake not to engage the Syrian government. Uh, had they come to the Security Council, I believe we would be able to agree a, co a concept which would be acceptable to all. We stated bluntly that the goal of our operation in response to the request of President Assad and on the basis of the decision granted by the Russian parliament to the Russian president in accordance with the Russian constitution, the goal is terrorism. And we are not supporting uh, anyone against uh, their own people. We fight terrorism. We consider terrorists those who have been recognized as such by the United Nations and by the Russian Federation legal system. If it looks like a terrorist, if it acts like a terrorist, if it walks like a terrorist, if it fights like a terrorist, it's a terrorist, right? Uh, I, would, uh, I would recall that uh, we always were saying that we are going to fight ISIL uh, and other terrorist groups. Uh, this is the same, uh, the same uh, position which the Americans are taking. 
the representatives of the coalition command have always been saying that their target are, targets are ISIL, and nusra and other terrorist groups. This is basically our position as well. We see eye to eye with the coalition on this one. So you see his point is that legally America was not invited into Syria by the Syrians, nor did it have the blessing of the United Nations Security Council. Therefore, it's an illegal incursion. Whereas Russia was invited by Bashar al-Assad to go into Syria, therefore their activities there are 100% legal and they're fighting against people who the United Nations have deemed to be terrorists and who their parliament have deemed to be terrorists. Now when you consider what we looked at earlier on today, and that was the, the statement against Israel in the last little while, um, and all the 20 or so uh, United Nations condemnations of them in the last four years, when there's only been one for the Syrians, you begin to think about, okay, if this is how international legal law works, how is it going to work for Israel in the future? Another interesting thing, September the 30th, is that this war on terror is a sacred war, according to the Orthodox Church, praising Putin. Basically, it's a holy war with the blessing of the Russian Orthodox Church. The problem has been that this whole situation kind of caught America off guard. What was it going to do with the whole situation? Well, it's interesting because Ezekiel chapter 38 says when the whole invasion takes place, the Western nations in verse 13 kind of say, well, what are you doing? Have you come to take a spoil and a prey? But they seem somewhat powerless to do anything about it. And that's kind of what we're looking at right now. There are concerns, John, that if Russian jets get involved in the skies above Syria, there are already French jets, there are warplanes from Australia, there are also uh, undisclosed warplanes from Israel. People are saying that this has all the makings for some sort of major international clash. Yeah, but that's why Israel, that's why Benjamin Netanyahu went to Moscow and met Putin, and that's why uh, Obama and Putin had their meeting uh, at the United Nations. Uh, the fact is that, I, I repeat, Russia has parked its tanks on the lawn, and the other states uh, have reacted uh, passively. They have said, okay, there's nothing we can do about this, let's at least coordinate. And Russia, of course, has been asking for coordination for three or four years. So you see that the West has reacted passively which is kind of the picture Ezekiel chapter 38 gives you. We're seeing the roles and things that are going on in Ezekiel as exactly what's going on around us today. And if there's any sort of you know, confusion as to whether or not you know, Russia is really the good guy in the Middle East, uh, here's a cartoon that was in our Canadian National Post where you've got the Russian bear with his little peace dove mask on and it says Putin's master plan for Syria uh, the Western and Arab countries, basically, uh, should really join Assad. Iran, Hezbollah, and Russia may also join this alliance. But you see, it's an alliance of nations that are coming together. But if there's any doubt, like the last speaker just said, Russia has planted its tanks on the lawn. They have boots in the Middle East. And it's very interesting, um, one of the American commentators, what he had to say just the other day. Here, Russia. Yeah, they struggled a little bit to take the Ukraine, didn't they? Yeah, there was some conversation about it and all. You knew what they were going to do. They did it. We got a weak president, you know. Now they just kind of waltz over into the Mid East. They were kicked out of the Mid East in '73, and now they're back. They're back, and that is no kidding back. And you watch them; they'll move quickly into there. And uh, they got a new sheriff in town with the Russians uh, coming in the Mideast. So there you have it. Out in the 70s, but they're back now. And he says, and they're back in a, in a big way. Well, friends, what we know is, of course, that Russia is going to provoke a greater war in the Middle East. And in fact, um, this was just today, but Dan let me in on this one. I was a little asleep with the switch, but Russian jets shot down by Turkish forces after entering Turkish airspace. So the, the heat in the Middle East is just getting hotter and hotter and hotter. So now you have actually allied NATO forces engaging with Russian forces and yet to be confirmed, but we're told that they've shot down Russian jets 
in the Middle East. What will the response be? We don't know. But what we do know is that we're living on the very knife edge of the kingdom age, on the time period when the kingdom of God is about to be established. We read in a book called Alpha Israel, written back in 1848, where the writer talked about many things like this. He says, the future movements of Russia are notable signs of the times because they're predicted in the scriptures of truth. The Russian autocracy in its plenitude and on the verge of dissolution is the image of Nebuchadnezzar standing on the mountains of Israel, ready to be smitten by the stone. When Russia makes its grand move for the building up of its image empire, then let the reader know the end of all things at present constituted is at hand. The long expected but stealthy advent of the king of Israel will be on the eve of becoming a fact and salvation will be to those who not only look for it but have trimmed their lamps by believing the gospel of the kingdom of God, or a kingdom unto obedience of faith and the perfection thereof in fruits meet for repentance. We want to spend our last couple of minutes talking about the invasion itself. You see, what's really amazing about the Bible is that the words of the Bible are really tomorrow's headlines, and they've already been written. They're already in place. You see, Russia has been looking to the south for many, many years. See, it's back from 1453 when Muhammad II pushed the Byzantine Empire and Byzantine Emperor and the Church out of St. Sophia's in Constantinople that Russia has had its designs on going back there and retaking St. Sophia's, which by all accounts is the Vatican of the Eastern, Ro or Eastern Orthodox religion. It was taken in 1453, and over and over again it's been stated that they want it back. In fact, the Russian uh, crosses on the roof of the Kremlin, you'll notice they're a little peculiar. There's a cross, but what's underneath those crosses? Well, it's the crescent moon because Russia has made the vow for many, many centuries that they will return to Constantinople and they will take Constantinople and they will take back uh, the city of uh, Constantinople and St. Sophia's. So we have in the Bible then, the headlines of tomorrow already recorded for us. And that is that Russia is going to invade Turkey. This is written in the Persian Post by a, a prophet, Daniel, a correspondent living in Babylon in 539 BC. And he says, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, that's Turkey, and the king of the north will come against him with like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen and many ships, and he's going to enter into the countries and overflow and pass over. So St. Sophia, after 560 years, is going to return to uh, the Greek Orthodox Church. And so, or the Russian Orthodox Church or the Eastern Orthodox religion. The invasion of Turkey then is given to us. This is what is described for us, that they're going to come down into Turkey. Um, but it's not just going to stop there, but it's going to pass over and it's going to enter into Turkey. And then it's going to continue on into the rest of the Middle East. Because it's going to overrun further than that, right into the area close to Israel. The same prophet, Daniel, reporting from Babylon 2,554 years ago, tells us that he's going to enter into the most glorious land, which is Israel. Many countries are going to be overthrown, in fact, but the ones that are going to escape out of his hand is Edom, Moab, and the chief of the children of Ammon, which we call Jordan today. So Israel, the glorious land, is going to be overrun, but Jordan is going to be under Western protection. Uh, the coalition basically will protest the invasion, but not really be able to do a whole lot to stop it. So they're going to move on from here down into the area of Israel, but the ring of uh, Western powers are going to stop them from entering to Jordan, uh, the Ammon, Moab, and Ammon that we read about in the, uh, the book of Ezekiel and of Daniel. However, they're going to move on from there, and the prophets tell us that Russia is going to invade Egypt. Daniel goes on to say that he shall stretch forth his hand upon the countries and the land of Egypt, and he will have power over the treasures of gold and silver and over the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Ethiopians are also going to be at his steps, or as it's put in another translation, marching in his footsteps. So Russia then is also going to move down and is going to invade Egypt itself right into the area of the south, going through Israel, 
and into Egypt. And uh, the prophet Isaiah describes how it will be given to the hand of a cruel Lord. But there's going to be rumors, intelligence reports that are going to take place that are going to cause the Russians to leave. Russians will withdraw to target Israel. Intelligence reports will spread panic in the Kremlin. We read in Daniel 11, 40, 44, Tidings out of the east and out of the north will trouble him. Therefore he shall go forth with great fury and destroy an utterly to make away many. So they're going to turn their forces around, wheeling them out of the land of Egypt and heading up into the land of Israel, where the great battle of Armageddon is finally going to take place. It's going to be a terrible time, and the headline again has already been written. That is that Jerusalem is going to fall. Israel, as it currently stands, is going to collapse. Its current government is going to be brought down. Russians are going to basically take the city, pillage it. The inhabitants are going to be taken captive, and prayer vigil will be given by desperate Jews, as we read elsewhere. Zechariah 14, verse 2 so here's a prophet, this is the Judean times, he's writing in 520 BC, describing the scene inside the city. I will gather all nations against Jerusalem to battle, that's the gathering, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Daniel, and so on. And the city shall be taken, the houses rifled, the women ravished, half the city shall go forth into captivity, but the residue of the people shall not be cut off. It's not going to be a complete victory, there still will be a remnant that remain there, and Joel describes also how they will pray to God. In fact, what they're going to do is establish their headquarters right in the middle of the city of Jerusalem. The Russian headquarters will be established in Jerusalem. The Temple Mount will be the Russian HQ. Israel resistance will be wiped out and thousands will flee to Jordan. So much for honoring their agreement with the Arabs, they want the holy places for themselves. Remember that whole crescent moon under the cross? That's really what's going to happen. Once the Arab pawn is no longer needed, they'll just toss it to the side. He will plant his tabernacles of his palaces between the seas in the glorious holy mountain, which of course is Mount Zion. And the Middle East will be plunged into the great battle of Armageddon. As the prophet John, writing in the Patmos Press, has to tell us, Middle East Armageddon. Divine intervention, though, is going to destroy armies in Israel. So the kings will go forth. Uh, unto the, sorry, which go forth to the kings of the earth, and the whole world gathering them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. He gathers them together to a place called, in the Hebrew tongue, Armageddon. And then the prophets tell us that this is when divine intervention is going to actually happen. There's going to be a massive earthquake that's going to devastate the Middle East and destroy the Russian forces on the mountains of Israel. It's going to split the Mount of Olives in two. Divine intervention is going to take place as we are told by Zechariah the prophet in the Judean news writing in 520 BC. So the Lord Jesus Christ is going to return to the Mount of Olives. He says in chapter 14 verse 4, His feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof towards the east and the west, and there's going to be a very great valley. Half of the mountain shall remove towards the north and half towards the south, and you will flee to the valley of the mountains, for the valley shall, of the mountain shall reach unto Azal, and the Lord my God shall come, and all the saints with thee. So this is going to be a time of great trouble such as never was, but the Russian forces are going to be devastated by this earthquake. And Ezekiel chapter 38, the prophet Ezekiel uh, in the Chaldean Courier, writing from the river Kibar 2,608 years ago, describes the scene. He says, surely in that day there shall be a great shaking in the land of Israel. He goes on to say, the mountains shall be thrown down, and every steep place shall fall, and every wall shall fall to the ground. He says, I'm going to call for a sword against Gog, that is, throughout all my, nation, my mountains, saith the Lord God. Every man's sword shall be against his brother. And there's going to be pestilence and blood, and there's going to be overflowing rain and hailstones, fire and brimstone. So civil war, plague, burning hail and the infrastructure destroyed by a massive earthquake, which scientists tell us to do what's described here, would have to be around the number of a 9.9. .9. So San Andreas and end of the world 2012 or whatever it was has nothing on any of this. This is the real deal. This isn't Hollywood. This is the real activity that's going to take place very soon when the whole world is going to be brought to its knees. And the Russian forces are going to be annihilated in the Middle East. This is not going to be an invasion that is going to be a victory for them. 
God brings them down there to destroy them and to set up his kingdom upon the earth. And that's the next headline. Kingdom of God set up on earth. Christians in disbelief. Jews return to the land. See, Christians believe that the kingdom of God's in heaven. Yet we've been praying, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth for many, many years. But now we find out that the Lord Jesus Christ is actually going to come back and set up a kingdom on the earth. Daniel chapter 2, the captive chronicle again, verse 44 says, in, these days, in the days of these kings shall the God of heaven set up a kingdom which shall never be destroyed. And the kingdom shall not be left to other people, but it's going to break in pieces and consume all the other kingdoms of the world. And it's going to stand forever. In fact, in Daniel chapter 2 and verse 35, it says, it's like a little stone that's going to hit the image and grow to become a mountain that covers the entire earth. And at the center of that, the Judean Times tells us, writing 2,770 years ago, there's going to be a temple built in Jerusalem. Yes, friends, a temple built in Jerusalem by the Jews where there will be animal sacrifice once again. The Dome of the Rock, built in 691 AD, is going to be gone, raised by the earthquake. And it'll come to pass in the last days, the mountain of the Lord's house will be established on the top of the mountains and be exalted above the hills. And all nations shall flow unto us, is what we read from the prophet Isaiah 2,200 or 770 years ago. That is going to be the center of the kingdom of God on earth. And the next headline is, is that when that takes place, Messiah is going to be placed upon his throne. King David, writing from Jerusalem 2,986 years ago, described how God would set his son upon his throne in Zion. He would issue a decree to all the nations to honor his son, and they will take counsel together again against him, but God's going to laugh them to scorn. And the rebellious nations will be broken into pieces like a potter's vessel. See, this is what the angel Gabriel decreed when he spoke to Mary some 2,000 20 years ago in Nazareth. This is what he has to say. Luke chapter 1 is where we read it. Behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. What is it that God's going to give him? The throne of his father, David. Where is he going to reign? Well, he's going to reign over the house of Jacob, which is the nation of Israel, forever. And of his kingdom there's not going to be any end. Well, years ago, when lots of schools used to put on nativity plays, hundreds of years are, you know, of, of this going on, which has all sort of mostly gone out of schools today because you know, we can't have the Bible, we can't actually trust in God, even though that's what's on the coins and in the national sort of oath of allegiance and in our national anthem in Canada as well. All that has to go, we have to kind of pretend it all didn't happen, right? When schools used to do plays, like I did when I was a little boy in a Christian school back in Britain years ago, we used to act this out. And we used to have Gabriel come. And Gabriel used to say that, you know what, you're going to have a son, and he's going to reign, sitting on the throne of David, ruling over Jacob forever. The house of Jacob. Now that kingdom is going to be no end. What? What's changed? That is the story. Messiah is going to be placed on the throne. That's what Psalm 2 is all about. Well, the prophet Micah in the Judean News prophesying 2,755 years ago tells us that the law then is going to go forth from Zion. Many nations shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, and we will walk in, he will teach us of his ways and we will walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, that's the mountain in Jerusalem, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. And that, friends, is what is finally going to bring about this great headline, peace on earth. Because that's what Gabriel was talking about. That's what the angels were announcing when Christ was born. And we read in Isaiah 2 what he's going to do, what the United Nations just cannot do. But he will. He will judge amongst the nations, rebuke many people. They will beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. That is the end of the story. Righteous rule will bring peace on earth. It's a real roller coaster ride till we get there. And we're sitting at the very top of that roller coaster as it goes up.
I hate roller coasters. The part I hate the most is the part where they put you in, click, down goes that thing, the belt goes over, and then it's ka-junk, 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 yes. as you go all the way up. Because you get to that very top and you're just waiting to get rocketed off. You know, that's the anticipation. I don't like heights to start with, so that part there just terrifies me. But friends, young people, that's where we live. This whole thing's about to launch. The roller coaster is right at the crest. There's no stopping it. It's going to go at any point in time. And when it does, it's going to be a great ride. It's going to bring about the kingdom of God on earth. And it's the fulfillment of what God's told us in the prophets. Bible prophecy. God declaring the end from the beginning. Telling us well in advance what he's going to do and how he's going to do it. Declaring the end from the beginning and ancient times, the things that are not yet done, saying, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. There's one last ad I'd like to share with you, though. It's a wanted ad. And it appears in the Judean News, and it was written many, many years ago. Wanted, kings and priests, kings and priests to reign over the earth must have the right characteristics, benefits, immortal life, and accommodations forever. Because that's what we read of in Revelation chapter 3, verse 21. To him that overcomes, I will grant to sit with me in my throne, even as I also overcame and am sat down with my father in his throne. Now, he doesn't promise us to sit with God in God's throne in heaven. He says, no, 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 you can sit with me in my throne. Well, what's his throne? It's the throne that was promised to him in Jerusalem. That's where we are promised. But you have to have the right qualifications because he that ruleth over men must be just, ruling over or ruling in the fear of God. And that's why it'll bring peace on earth. So that's the story, brothers and sisters, that we've looked at in the last little while. Those are the headlines that are going to appear in the next little while. We've been invited to be a part of it. It's exciting times that we live in. But when we were kids, we used to play a game called hide and seek. Somebody would go and hide, uh, or they would hide their eyes, and the rest of us would run out into the woods or wherever it was in the house, and we'd all go hide. And then they'd have to come and seek us. And the seeker would call out to the kids that were all hiding, ready or not, here I come. And the Lord Jesus Christ is about to come, whether we're ready or not. So we better prepare ourselves for that great day. Thank you.